Good evening. Um, thank you for this uh, warm welcome, and it's uh, it, it's a pleasure to be here. I had a, I had the opportunity to um, walk through this great building um, over the course of this afternoon and see, um, I guess, some of you um, and your work. And uh, this is a this is an extraordinary place, and you can sort of feel an energy that um, uh, I hope. Uh, tonight, uh, I can speak to some of the ideas that we're observing uh, and that we have observed that might uh, be currently a part of your thinking as you're as you're going out and, and producing extraordinary design and architecture, uh, or if you're in the sciences or if you're in business and you're thinking about how these worlds are converging. Um, my aim tonight is to kind of share with you the view of the world that we've amassed over the last few years um, from our vantage point at SEED, um, which although founded and kind of firmly rooted in the sciences, um, I think you'll see tonight that the way we think about science, um, the way we communicate science, uh, is perhaps a little bit different than um, we typically assume uh, and then we typically see uh, when we visualize or, or illustrate science uh, commonly. So what I want to advocate and, uh, and hopefully prove to you tonight is that we are on the cusp of something extraordinary. Um, I've labeled it a scientific renaissance because I think that it's, um, in fact, as grand as uh, the renaissance of the past. I think that what we're on the cusp of is a new degree of understanding of the world around us, coupled with a singular ability to manipulate it um, for good. And this combination of understanding and capacity to manipulate and affect um, is really uh, profoundly new. Um, and something that can only come about through the convergence of the kinds of disciplines that, that we'll talk about tonight. So I want to start zoomed out uh, and progressively zoom in. We are living in extraordinary times. Science has given us the capacity to see worlds that were previously unimaginable, let alone seen from the cosmological to the nano. And with this capacity and images like this from Hubble um, that NASA said was just a stone's throw from the Big Bang, gives us this sense of humility and also this sense of perspective that only great science and great science imagery has the capacity to share. This is a reminder of how relatively inconsequential we are. Um, we're one of a hundred billion stars in a hundred billion galaxies. And we orbit this pale blue dot. And yet, uh, we today are gaining the capacity, like in previous decades, to see the Earth from above. Today, we're gaining the perspective through science of seeing the inner machinations of the Earth, seeing its relationship um, in the universe. We're able to produce machines capable of uh, replicating the origins of our planet. And we're gaining this entirely new perspective. Zooming in a little, we're also now through the incredible advances in genomics and biochemistry, we're now starting to arrive at a point um, where we can not only anticipate being able to manipulate genomics, we can now start envisioning this, which are the first synthetic cells by Craig Venter and his team, where we can now start using these building blocks to create life itself. And this opens up some incredible questions, right? So what is life to begin with? And do we have a common definition of it? 
And as we start entering this territory where we are today, where we have the information, we have the data, we have the tools, and now it's about finding some common understanding of the nomenclature, of a sense of ethics, of a sense of sort of common engagement and participation in these revolutions. Because it's incredibly frightening to look at something like this without having an appreciation for what it is and what it has the potential to do. It's exhilarating once you look at an image like this and you have the capacity to understand the genomics, the ability yourself to synthesize that, to make it, to change it. And if we've collectively reached a point where our collective mores, our collective ethics are aligned. So we're at this point in the case of the life sciences and biology where what's in front of us is not going to be driven by technology as much as it is about negotiating these capabilities and arriving at some common understanding of what they can do for us and common platforms where we all feel like we can participate in them. This is the coolest machine ever produced. This is the Large Hadron Collider, one of the magnets underground in Switzerland that right now is colliding protons nearly at the speed of light to arrive at the conditions that gave birth to our universe. This is a feat of engineering, it's a feat of design, it's a feat of science. It took over 60 countries, over $8 billion, half the particle physicists in the world to bring a project like this to fruition. And in the great tradition of big science undertakings like the International Space Station, the Human Genome Project, clearly these kinds of undertakings, massive achievements, can't happen unless we as a globe participate in them because they're too costly, they're too risky, and also we as a variety of disciplines come together to be able to produce them. In this case, this took engaging the local public as this bisects the Franco-Swiss border, referendums. You may have heard um, questions as to whether when this turned on a few months ago it would <laughs> swallow the planet. Happily, it hasn't. Um, and of course, dozens and dozens and dozens of what we could call disciplines, but, but really are just ways of thinking brought together to bring a project like this to fruition. The thing is, is that when you look at a project like this, we can look at it and say that this is simply a driving force. It's an, it's an enterprise into itself. It's driving us towards converging disciplines, towards arriving at some holistic understanding of things for its multidisciplinarity, and that we're sort of artificially constructing these trends. And I think for quite a while in our country and broadly in the West, we viewed this notion of bringing disciplines together as just the next big thing. It's just a great trend. And so let's bring faculties together and let's bring different departments and a company together and let's whiteboard it out together. When I asked the physicists at CERN, you know, why they build this machine, it's because it's the only way. It's not because they wanted to build an $8 billion magnet. It's because it was the answer. It was the solution. So if we want to understand the nature of matter, the weakness of gravity, the nature of dark energy, dark matter, where we come from, this is what it takes. This renaissance that we're on the cusp of, that science is motivating, is happening all over the world. Science has historically been an engine for competitiveness for the United States, and we've used projects like going to the moon as an embodiment of American power in the world. Today, 
you can contrast images from our space race with recent launches in China and all over the world as a reflection of how global this cultural shift in fact is. Science is now figuring prominently into the development strategies of beyond the G8, beyond the G20, beyond the BRIC countries. Science is now figuring prominently into the development strategies of even the truly developing world. Yesterday, um, I had the pleasure of spending the day at the World Bank and the State Department um, talking about the role of the kinds of things we'll talk about this evening in fueling the conversation about development around the world. Science as an engine for development. These are profoundly new ideas, and they're rooted in the notion that science can be more and, in fact, is more than just its output. That science is more than the drugs and technologies that we derive from it. It's a methodology. It's a way of thinking. It's something that's far grander than just its output. C.S. Kiang, who's a brilliant professor at Peking University, wrote this in Seed a little while ago. He said, complexity is the new science. Everything is complex. Every problem in the world is a system. The disciplines are classified by people, but nature never recognizes them. We created biology. We created physics. We created chemistry because they were useful devices to understand the world. And these were successful devices, right? We have amazing understandings of the world around us because of these mechanisms. So today when we talk about bringing things together to arrive at some consilient in E.O. Wilson's conception understanding towards some unified knowledge, towards some unified understanding of the world, it's not because this is some artificial construct. It's because for many other parts of the world, they've recognized that this is simply the way of understanding. It's not quite so linear. It's not quite so, let's go from A to B, build a solution, and, and arrive there as quickly as we can. Sometimes it's about kind of circling the problem over and over and over again, and touching all sorts of different modes of thought to be able to arrive at an understanding. And only now are we starting to recognize this mode of understanding in this part of the world. This is what science looks like today. So this is 800,000 scientific papers clustered into 776 scientific paradigms linked by common author and by citations amongst the papers. So zoomed in. And the concept from this project from Brad Paley, Katty Borner, and some others that we published is to begin to appreciate that when you take a snapshot of the frontier of knowledge today, the most interesting connections are residing between computer science and brain research, between ecology and astrophysics, between therapeutic research and virology. And again, they're happening there. They're moving in this direction because this is where the answers lie, not because we're just looking for something new out there. At the same time that we are recognizing that everything is a system and that there's this inherent complexity in what it is that we're trying to understand today, whether in the theoretical realm, like bringing together Newton and Einstein to arrive at an understanding of the universe, 
or whether it's to understand cities or understand markets. To understand these, what we now recognize to be complex systems, requires that we also recognize the interdependence of all of the issues that we care about today. And so to understand something like epidemics requires that we understand the environment in which these epidemics are forming. To understand the environment, we need to understand climate change. To understand climate change, we need to anticipate growth, economic and otherwise. To understand economic growth, we need to think about population and changes and shifts in population and demographics. To understand shifts in population and demographics, we need to anticipate epidemics. There's no possible way of understanding this moment in time without recognizing this complexity and interdependence and solving for it. So the features of this moment are the scale with which we can analyze, with which we can explore, which, with which we can measure, the complexity that we now recognize in all the systems that surround us, whether they're economic or biological, the pace of change. Part of this is motivated by us. Part of this is our choice to push the laws of computer science forward and, and build supercomputers, allowing us to push experimentation, push, push knowledge faster. Part of it is just need. Part of it is realizing that a seven billion person planet has different needs than a two billion person planet. And an interdependence of all of these issues on the agenda. So with that framing, we need a new way of looking at the world. We need to recognize that these are the attributes of this time. This is how we live. And we need a new lens because the approaches that we took in the 20th century to understand the world around us are simply no longer sufficient. The disciplines that we constructed, they're not getting us there anymore. We see market failures of unprecedented proportion. We see the risk of emerging pandemics like swine flu, SARS. We see the rise of the impact of climate change. This is happening. So we need a new toolbox. Conveniently, we've been here before. And in this time, when Copernicus and Vesalius and Da Vinci looked at the world around them and tried to construct their own approach to understanding the world, it was rooted in a lot of the same similar observations that we see today. They viewed the body as a complex network. They saw the impact of long distance travel on the rise and spread of epidemics. Today we see the consequences of globalization. They had profound revolutions like planets revolving around the sun, seeing new forms of interaction between systems. Today we're seeing it at a nanoscale, at a molecular scale, at a, at a biochemical scale. So just a different scale, but the same types of revolutions. We're seeing an approach to practical problem solving recognizing that the problems are imminent and we need to derive means mechanisms to be able to solve for problems. A few years ago, as you heard, um, I got to meet Paola Antonelli. Um, Paola is one of the most, uh, I think, brilliant thinkers period in the world, um, but certainly one of the most brilliant thinkers in design. And we just kind of started talking. Um, Paula is a science geek. Uh, I'm fascinated by design and, and certainly don't have anywhere near the expertise, but a curiosity and, a, and a, um, an interest in design. And we started talking about what was happening in science and what was happening in design, and where they were heading. And what we recognized is that they were both at this kind of critical point. 
the revolutions that science is, was bringing forth require a completely new way of interaction with society in order for them to reach their intended impact. At the same time, the opportunities that science was presenting, is presenting, require that we have completely new languages or interfaces to interact with what science was producing. From a design standpoint, design goes through cycles where I think it, it suffers from an identity crisis as to what design really is. Um, and whether it's limited in scope to our aesthetic well-being, or whether it can contribute um, beyond that to the overall well-being of the world. And there are moments where evolutions in design arrive at just the right moment um, to leverage its own craft, its own capabilities, to contribute to something that's larger than it, but to which only it can result. And we began bringing together our friends in science and our friends in design. And for about 18 months, two years, every month, brought them together to MoMA to talk. And every month, we would have discussions about all sorts of things, some incredibly esoteric and, and far removed from, from reality, um, others extremely practical about process and, and how scientists and designers arrive at solutions. And what started to emerge um, were the beginnings of this project, Design and the Elastic Mind, um, the exhibition that Paola curated, organized uh, at MoMA which was the first time that science figured into this incredible institution. And the concept was to look at how science and design were beginning to interact to arrive at new understandings, new interfaces, new approaches to this massive revolution, to this massive change. So I want to share a few of the ideas that have been percolating since, some of the work that buttresses these ideas, um, and give you a little bit of a sense of how I think only through the collaboration of science with design will we arrive at that great potential that I alluded to earlier, that I illustrated earlier, where science is having this unique potential to improve the state of the world, where it's improving our lives, where it's improving our cities, um, where it's having all sorts of consequences on the world, the only way we get there is through a consilience of science with design. The first dimension is how design is humanizing this revolution. In 1953, we got this first model of the genome, of DNA, from Watson and Crick. And 50 years later, we can now spit in a tube, send it away, and, and four weeks later get this, which is my DNA. And I can interact with this data, which, you know, when I look at it like this is pretty meaningless. But we now have a mechanism of something physical that I can spit in, mail, get back, and somehow have some physical interaction with that discovery from 50 years ago. Now once we have this, the challenge is how do we render it understandable? How do we find ways of making sure that we can manipulate this information, relate it to other things, do the kinds of things that we need to provide context so that we can actually understand the information? 
So in this case, this is work by Ben Fry for seed, comparing a human genome with other species, so we have context. Or work from catalog tree, anticipating how we bring this revolution into our pockets, into our wallets, and how we'll think about feeling like we can participate in this revolution as we carry around our genomes. Or, as we look to contrast the human genome with the genome of our close relative, the chimp, and we see over 98% similarity because we can see it, because we can now produce representations of this information, we can visualize this information. The consequence of this is that we now start changing our sense of social mores. So in Spain, the conversation led to, should the great apes be afforded basic human rights? And the answer was yes. And so as conversations around the world revolving around human rights, around capital punishment, around all these big, major institutions that seem stable, seem kind of rooted in our society, they're now being transformed, first, because of the scientific revolution, second, because of the communication that design is affording us. Design is also exposing the intelligence, the complexity, the beauty that's inherent in natural systems. This has far-reaching consequence. It will affect the materials we use. It will affect the way we understand markets, their resilience, for example, looking at ecological systems and designing models to anticipate and build in resilience into financial markets. They're changing the way that we look at the metabolism of cities and design the cities of the future. Um, Richard Feynman, the great physicist, um, used to say that when you give him a rose and you give an artist a rose, the, you know, the common understanding, the common view is that the artist is going to produce this poetic appreciation, this poetic understanding of the rose. And the scientist is going to ruin it all, is going to unweave that rainbow, deconstruct it, and render it perfunctory. When in fact, if we could all access really the science behind the beauty that the artist sees, and we could understand the molecular machinations that allow this rose to be so beautiful, that make it smell, because that has reason, that give it a certain shape, and that has reason, then we have a much richer appreciation for the beauty around us. And that has, again, not only the consequences that are very practical to cities, materials, markets, but also just to appreciating the earth appreciating the world around us. And part of a renaissance, part of something as fantastic as this, is also just changing our own sense of self, our sense of place, and our sense of relationship to the earth, the, the, earth, the world around us. This is fantastic work from Eric Demain at MIT in this amazing field of computational origami and exposing properties of mathematics merging with properties of paper to give us um, magnificent new appreciations of mathematics. The work from Studio Libertini to look at the capacity of bees to build their own structures. Work from Neri Oxman um, included in Design in the Elastic Mind looking at the processes, um, the capacity for biological systems to produce materials, to evolve, to generate 
um, and exposing these underlying algorithms uh, in her work. And at this point, or the work of Aranda Lash, looking at modularity, um, this is uh, amazing work uh, that was produced also for Design of the Elastic Mind, um, looking at generative systems, generative algorithms. Um, in all of these cases, uh, today, this resides in the realm of the theoretical. Uh, and we see work like this, and it's beautiful. It's a new aesthetic. Um, the risk, of course, is that this, like other um, things I'll mention later, are simply aesthetic revolutions. And we now just do that in concrete and, and just put it up on a wall, and it's beautiful, and we buy it, and it goes to Sotheby's. Or that in exposing these understandings to a completely new community that isn't studying the deep complexities of biology through biology, a completely new pool of knowledge from which to contribute. One of the hallmarks of this moment is the scale at which we're navigating. And science has limitations. Scientists have limitations uh, that are, part of them are just human, that scientists going into science might have this limitation. In other cases, it's the craft of science itself that's self-limiting. Um, there was this amazing book called Flatland, written by English essayist uh, Edwin Abbott in the 1800s. And in it, he described this world, this flatland, that is essentially just a two-dimensional world. So you can imagine shapes of paper moving on shapes of paper, on a big sheet of paper. And one form would recognize the other form based on edges, based on the surface, things like that. And this world would just go on and on and on, and it was, you know, it's a beautiful book about this world. At the end of the book, our two-dimensional planet here is about a third dimension, this distant world where they live in 3D, and it freaks them out. Um, and in the book, he begins to elucidate how a lower dimensional universe might understand one that's higher dimensional. So today, turns out, that to understand the frontier of physics, we need to understand a universe that's 11-dimensional. So for string theory, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, for string theory to be true, then our universe has to have 11 dimensions. To contemplate what 11 dimensions is, is <laughs> no simple task. And science hasn't been able to advance neither a theoretical um, nor really a, certainly not a literary nor a theoretical understanding of it. So this is a project commissioned by TBA 21 um, that involved the Albert Einstein professor of physics at Princeton, Paul Steinhardt, um, Aranda Lash, architect in New York, Arup, um, and some other collaborators to bring together um, an understanding from theoretical physics with the craft and capacity of design and architecture to introduce possible representations and illustrations of higher dimensionality. And they turned it into a physical structure that we could interact with um, that has been touring the world that was just recently in Istanbul, and bringing together a new collaboration that science hasn't seen. Scientists are not historically interacting with architects to help them understand problems, maybe to build their lab, but not to understand the universe. 
At the Ecole Polytechnique in Lausanne, Henry Markram and his colleagues are building a replica of the human brain powered by blue gene supercomputers. Sharing the cafe downstairs are the architects at EPFL. And as the neuroscientists are thinking about architecting a human brain, the modularity, the relationships that are inherent in this challenge, they're benefiting from exposure, interaction, and dialogue with architects. So, in order for us to make sense of these complex systems, we need to be speaking a common language. The challenge is that as we are bringing together so many different disciplines to the table, and as we're bringing together so many nations now to the table, this isn't evident. And so we need to first raise the issue of a common language and then figure out how to uh, actually construct one. In 1801, coming out of the Enlightenment, William Playfair, um, a Scottish geologist, was trying to show the distribution of the Ottoman Empire. And he came up with this circular thing. And this was our first pie chart. And at the time, this was a revolution. And it took years for this to arrive at a point where we can, and never mind us, three-year-olds, four-year-olds can look at that and understand the relationship. Today, the relationships that we're trying to understand require a new language. Data visualization is this fantastic new realm that's been emerging over the last few years to provide us with the mechanisms of understanding the data and via the data, the complex systems around us. Not only is this about, like I suggested with the generative architecture, um, the biomimicry work earlier, this isn't simply an aesthetic revolution. It can be. It can absolutely just be that. Or it can be what design can be, and not just be art, um, but be a mechanism for actually understanding. So, I want to give you some examples and, and share a project that we're currently working on in this space. So, just about four weeks ago, um, we launched a new project from Seed uh, in partnership with GE called Visualizing.org. And the idea is to bring together the immense amount of data being made available in the world by government agencies, by scientific research organizations, by NGOs, with the design community that increasingly is um, curious about how to interact with this data, to apply data visualization techniques to it, um, and to contribute to this new, this new world. And so visualizing is, um, what it says, really a community of people trying to make sense of complex issues through data and design. To get here, um, to bring this project to life, we've partnered with uh, over 20 uh, design schools all over the world, uh, the very best design schools, um, including just recently uh, yours right here, um, to allow students and professors to use a new platform where they can share data, where they can upload visualizations all under a Creative Commons license, where they can have these visualizations peer reviewed by the community, which is critical in order for visualization to not simply be an aesthetic form, 
but to actually arrive at a point where we know what's good and what's actually improving understanding. And we've partnered with media organizations, think tanks, NGOs, big conferences around the world to ensure that the work ultimately gets seen by millions and gets used. So whether it's the World Economic Forum, TEDMED Conference, um, all sorts of organizations to ensure that as the UN High Commission on Refugees releases a report, we can bring the design community together to understand this data and represent it and put it out there into the public domain. So um, one of the visualizations I want to show you is something that we did at SEED for the World Economic Forum. And the reason why I want to show this is because I think this, this particular project kind of gives a sense for what data visualization can be doing. This is still at the very, very, very beginning, and there's plenty of room for improvement and iteration. But this is starting to give us a sense of what we can now do to try to understand the systemic relationships in the world. So what we did is collaborated with the World Economic Forum to ask 700 experts that they called together from what they considered to be the 60 or so most important areas of the future. So it could be the future of human rights, the future of oceans, um, the future of India, and ask them to relate their domain to the other domains on the global agenda. So that for the first time when all of these figureheads could come together, these thinkers could come together, there could be an appreciation for how it is that they related to one another. Now this is anticipating, obviously, much more powerful tools, right? So obviously a lot more interesting to incorporate raw data sets from these domains, create semantic relationships, create triple stores, create all sorts of powerful tools to really look at um, a systemic view of the world. But for now, this is a sort of superficial but yet powerful kind of new way of navigating what's going on in the world. So what we gave them was a tool to be able to look at pandemics, for example, and look for those other domains in green that the pandemics experts felt that they could really benefit from consultation with. So terrorism and weapons of mass destruction, decision-making and incentive systems, for example, on the other hand, who was interested in interacting with them? So strategic foresight, aging society, global healthcare systems, and the areas where there was mutual interest with catastrophic risks. So this became the basis for starting to navigate the agenda in a much more useful way. This year, on the premise that we can only take this idea so far, we asked the World Economic Forum if they would release this data from last year and from this year into the public domain and turn it over to the entire design community to offer up better ways of looking at the relationships on the global agenda. So they've done that. You can now go on to visualizing, download the data for free, uh, and participate in a challenge that they've hosted where the winner not only gets a cool cash prize, but has their visualization used by these 700 experts when they come together for what's billed as the world's biggest brainstorm in Dubai in a few weeks. So the deadline for those interested is uh, November 15th. So I won't share too much more about this project. It's live, you can go up on visualizing.org, but really what we're trying to do is take this phenomenon and put it one step forward and ensure that it has its intended consequence as this new domain of design. You can get a feel for how visualizing kind of figures between these different domains of public data, design schools, social web, and the general public. So one other small point I want to make on visualizing um, is how do we increase participation, and I'll move into another subject with this, is how do we increase participation in this revolution? And one of the things we've been doing is uh, to create what we've called a visualizing marathon. 
So this was a, a 24 hour student data visualization competition that we held in New York uh, about a week ago with 100 students from eight design schools um, coming together, given a design challenge to solve with data visualization that had to do with sustainable planetary boundaries using really interesting new science and then all public domain data and come together in teams to solve a design challenge. We're hoping that this concept of bringing designers together, taking scientific data, putting it out, um, the winner of this competition that we just announced today um, will have their work uh, exposed, put out there before the big COP16 uh, climate summit in Cancun to ensure that this work is helping to advance the conversation in advance of a big policy meeting. Another major area where design and science are converging is in actually taking this knowledge and converting it into impact and ensuring that there's real impact that comes from the knowledge. And there's plenty of projects, and, and this is an area that I um, uh, will just touch on briefly. But without a question, without designers to physically take this information and this knowledge and convert it into experiences that cause emotional response, then the scientific data can simply be data. It can simply be perfunctory and, and, and limited in its potential. These are projects for MoMA's rising currents, um, looking at the impact of climate change and anticipating solutions, bringing forth solutions where the public is responding emotionally to them, but also recognizing potential innovative solutions that solve for these problems. And finally, as a notion that I think um, is critical for us to move this cultural shift forward, we have this sense that science is this isolated and um, very rarefied community. It's a craft that can only be undertaken by a few. And that's true. So that really cool machine at LHC, you know, we can't all go operate it. We can't all go do advanced theoretical physics. But we have this notion, for some reason, that because of that, we can't participate in science. So you may not have mastered Escoffier, but you can cook, right? And you may not be able to paint like Matisse, but you can pick up a paintbrush and paint. And nothing stops you from doing it. There's not this sense of some barrier to entry that we have with science. As if somehow science is immune and, and excluded from broad participation. So the only way to solve this is either by completely changing science, changing its nomenclature, changing its education, changing all these kinds of things, which isn't going to happen over our lifetime or, or a couple of lifetimes, or by acknowledging that the most important thing right now for us to become collectively more scientifically literate as a society. And it's my belief that the only way we benefit from the potential of science is if there is not quite a resistance to science that we've noticed in society over the last few years. And the way we get there is with a profound revolution in how we view scientific literacy. That it's not about graduating more scientists. That our goal as a society isn't to make more scientists. It's to find a way to invite all seven billion of us into science. And by that I mean much more the methodologies of science, the process of science, the thinking of science than the facts of science. And the way in is through design. Because the tinkering, because the experimentation, because the attributes of design that are very populist and fun and easy to interact with ultimately get us there. They're the portal into scientific literacy. So it could be in gaming, project like Spore, where we'll write collaborated with astrobiologists 
and where in interacting in this video game environment, we're creating life, we're understanding concepts, we're experimenting, we're hypothesizing. Or it could be more tangible, and it could be fooling around with bio bricks. This is a project from Drew Endy uh, that started at MIT um, and now has blossomed into the iGEM competition. And taking this domain of synthetic biology and turning it over to designers, where let's imagine what your life would be like if you had no computer. So today the computer is profoundly rooted in your practice. It's the interface. But these bio bricks are now available. You can splice these together and start creating organic, real, vibrant, vital systems. And it opens up an entirely new realm. And all of us can do this. All of us can participate. All of us can feel like scientists because we once all were. When we were kids and we would go and take some water from an ocean, from a lake, and question whether it's blue and then extract it and see that it's not blue everywhere. When we tried to understand how it is that ants are interacting, building colonies, we're just observing. It starts with this level of observation, of experimentation, of ultimately just proceeding down the path of the scientific method, which very much mirrors design thinking and design methodology. So I think beyond giving us a new language, beyond solving world problems, beyond exposing the hidden beauty and complexities of nature and deriving new models and understandings for the world, we can all become scientists through design. And that can profoundly change the world. So I think that where we are today is the communities of science and design are now interacting in ways that are unique. And I believe unique to this time. We've historically seen interactions between art and science, between the humanities and science, to some extent with literature. We've seen Proust anticipate contemporary knowledge of neuroscience. And we've seen great painters anticipate understandings of memory and vision. Today, the most powerful convergence is between science and design. Design is going to bring us the scientific revolution that we now have on our doorstep. It will enable us to participate in it. It will enable us to understand it. Um, and it excites us. It gives us the ability to feel like we ourselves are a part of this. And so often, the big scientific changes are frightening. And design is giving us an ability to deal with those fears as well. So if you think about the work of Eduardo Cac and his GFP bunny, these are great examples of taking something that's changing, the democratization of genomics, making something that's a little bit frightening, that's causing some emotional stir, and that's causing us to have a dialogue about it. It could be the image that you saw about a contrast of human genome and chimp genome that's changing the way we think about human rights. It could be data visualizations about safe planetary boundaries that will affect climate change policy. We're at this moment right now where if the design community embraces this power that it has uniquely, great things will come. Thank you.
Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I think that in many cases, science is what's driving these revolutions, but um, uh, the revolutions can be more immediately um, seen and, and interpreted and interacted with uh, in the realm of economics, um, in the realm of um, understanding cities, um, understanding uh, poverty, uh, development, so all of these domains, um, you know, I yesterday was having conversations with folks from USAID that are kind of struggling to um, create new models and visual representations of development. Um, so there are so many different touch points now for how the knowledge uh, that science and technology is providing us. In some cases, it might be proxies that we're creating. So as we think about development, it might be looking at electricity and satellite images of electricity. It might be using mobile phones. It might be using social networks to provide us with this data. Um, but then applying sort of a, a uniform uh, approach of how do we understand this data, how do we visualize it, and then how do we make sure that we have some sense of peer review so that we do have a sense of what's strong, what's not strong, how do we improve so that we start kind of advancing the field. But it's, um, I think the touch points are, you know, nearly universal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so I think, I mean, I think this is a, this is very much a consequence of reaching, you know, sort of reaching the wall um, in a lot of the areas of inquiry. In, in the case that you mentioned, it's cancer, um, where, you know, the war hasn't been won, and so it takes some new approach. And the approach that, that you're, you know, alluding to is, Introducing physical sciences, mathematics, you know, into the equation, um, but it's it's elsewhere as well, right? It's it's in thinking about the um, optimal size of cities. These are incredibly complex systems, and applying the study of uh, metabolic pathways and biological models to um, those systems. It's it's applying uh, models of um, ecological sustainability and resilience to the way we now think about markets uh, and how to imbue them with greater um, early warning signals that uh, uh, will give us better indications of when markets might fail. So um, I think this, this notion of uh, applying models from, from domains that previously seemed incredibly foreign to the problem at hand to these problems where we've reached a sort of critical point of lack of understanding is rooted in um, the fungibility of the data and the fungibility of these models that now feel like we can actually manipulate them, play with them, simulate, uh, and simulation is a kind of critical component of this as well, where we can test things in silico, um, and uh, that's the kind of projects that we'll see from, from Danny Hillis and Cancering, uh, where we can now start building um, really powerful uh, simulations and, and uh, test these theories, test these new models in ways that before um, we could kind of theoretically uh, uh, apply one model to another but didn't have the 
interface and the capacity to actually test and take that idea forward beyond, of course, testing it in the real world and creating real world scenarios and experiments. So we've introduced this new notion, this, this extra uh, step of simulation, um, uh, which I think is giving us the, the flexibility to play with these models, whereas before it was a kind of heavy enterprise to apply one to the other. Today, you know, we, we did a conversation proceed with uh, Carla Ratti and Steven Strogatz, a mathematician and architect, and just over the course of the conversation, there was an understanding of we should we should totally just start moving this model to this model, and and they immediately began a collaboration and published a paper. So you you can start these things, you can iterate on these things because um, the capacity is there and the uh, uh, mechanisms of simulation are now available. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's two ways of looking at that. One is that the there are so many ways now to collect the data, um, and a lot of them fall into this realm of citizen science, where um, we can all be collecting data about climate change. We can all be collecting data about um, you know bird migration patterns. We can all be collecting data uh, about new species. We can all be turning our computers over to process the search for extraterrestrial life. We can all be turning our computers over to process heavy-duty protein sequencing. So in some capacity now, the, the proliferation of mobile devices is giving us uh, a, a tool to be able to go collect data and contribute to a lot of these projects, and also just the processing capacity of our you know, home computers is giving us that capacity as well. So there's there, there's that angle where under the realm of citizen science, there are so many interesting projects where we can be collectively um, searching for and, and and mining that data. On the other end, um, uh, I, I think that we are, um, uh, we're very often, um, we very often sort of have this sense of limitation that this data um, uh, is has to come from you know sort of powerful telescopes or sort of powerful Earth monitoring systems. When in fact today, the proxies that I was suggesting earlier are possibly even more powerful and more dynamic. So we often build systems based on these large scale analyses of the planet or large scale analyses of systems. When today, it's a lot more interesting if we could find a proxy that's if we looked at lights that were on, this was an amazing project a couple of years ago, if we can look at electricity usage based on satellite imagery, we can now start to um, uh, track development in a completely different way. So it's a proxy for the more you know, rigorous um, OECD type data sets that will ultimately come that we can't do ourselves, but we have these proxies. We have proxies in the form of mobile. And then at the same time, we also have this new Detritus. We now have our footprint on the social web. And so as that proliferation um, is now becoming analyzed, as there's 500 million Facebook users and so on and so forth with Twitter and everything else, we can now start using that data where we're not intentionally producing data, we're just leaving it behind. And that creates an entirely new mechanism of both visualizing and modeling. So there was some amazing research just published um, this past week, two weeks ago, uh, uh, using um, just what we're leaving behind on Twitter to give us some powerful new algorithms to anticipate uh, market dynamics. All of these kinds of things, where we're not collecting the data, but we're just casual bystanders and leaving it behind is another way that we're participating in it. Thank you. 
Yep. Yep. I mean, so I think that, uh, I think that the, that will, that will be a natural, um, consequence of greater interaction between these disciplines. Um, today, uh, it's a lot easier for designers to, um, become aware of new science because it's widely reported and it becomes important. Because, right, so, that's right. So, this is what's happening today. I think that in order for scientists to become more aware of new thinking and design, the converse, it will necessarily come from proximity because new thinking and design is not going to figure on page one. So it's not going to be sort of this commonly distributed news. It's going to become process. It's going to become in the realm of academia. And to date, that line of communication hasn't existed. So scientists aren't sitting in buildings with architects and hearing about new theories in architecture. So I think this is a case where short term, this is about physical proximity. I, I think practically speaking, short term, this is about literally just putting them together in the same building. Um, and that's how we arrive at that understanding. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we created visualizing because we observed that need, because that was precisely the need that we observed. We, we feel that um, there's a plethora of data, and that's rising, and that's great. There's plenty of open source software tools, free software tools to do data visualization, and the languages are getting even better and better and better and more and more understood programming languages. The missing piece was really the the media that organizes this community. Um, and I think that today, uh, what we're trying to do is connect what's going on in the world, so just news, with data visualization. That's just a very simple connection. But using the power of the social web, we're just pushing content out because we, we have platforms. And as a media company, we can talk to millions um, through our channels. Uh, and then, because we're building a community, um, the most interesting thing to watch over the last few weeks on visualizing has simply been uh, uh, a, a report from OECD on food security and obesity that gets reported, and then to follow how, on Twitter, that conversation begins to incorporate, eventually, a visualization under a CC license from visualizing that some designer had uploaded or has uploaded. And our, our, our mission really is to get it to the point that there's enough visualizations that are being uploaded, enough that are being tagged with common taxonomies, which is really not insignificant. That's, you know, that's an issue. Um, and, uh, enough, um, uh, uh, you know, interaction with just the social graph so that these things do become a part of the fabric of our understanding. So that's, we created it precisely because that's the, that's what we saw missing. Um, and we're doing it uh, without a, uh, 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 it's, it's entirely free, right? So it's an entirely free and shared resource. And so I don't know that, you know, there's other platforms per se or, or something like that. I think that um, more importantly, I hope people just use the visualizations that designers upload and spread them and use them and, and embed them uh, across the web so that they do ultimately have impact. We don't need lots of platforms. We just need lots of visualizations, lots of peer review, so that the public, you know, has choice and they can turn somewhere um, as news is unfolding and know that they have a visualization a part of it. And the other thing that's important to us is we're not trying to 
we're not setting out to create a destination. So that's not our goal. We're, we're much, much, much more interested in you experiencing these visualizations anywhere else. Um, but just find them, you know, you can find them on visualizing, you can find the data on visualizing, and they become a nexus, but we're not trying to just, you know, bring you to visualizing to come watch if it's just interact with a visualization. We want it to be completely um, distributed. So even the notion of a platform is, you know, almost like a false concept for us. It's important that it started as a platform, but for it to be successful and for this to be, you know, something that we, we aspire to, it's really much more distributed. Pleasure.